Right. Uh, we are here now tonight with the world's living expert on Cornell Woolwich, um, Mike Nevins, as he likes to be known. Um, he is also a law professor in St. Louis who has taught a course um, on law and movies with some law and film noir for a good 30 years or so, a pioneer in making that Gath, writing a wonderful piece, I have to say, on Cape Fear, the great thriller that Martin Scorsese cruelly messed up when he remade it in 1991. I know Mike agrees with me on that. Uh, so he's written the standard, the, the great biography, a great biography as a biography, as well as a great biography of uh, Cornell Woolrich. He's also written a book on Melody Queen, Am I not right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and and so, a few others. And a few others. Yes, amazingly prolific, as you can tell. So we're very honored to have him here with us today. And he is going to begin um, with a statement. Yeah. We lawyers like to make opening statements in court. Uh, well, I'll start by saying... Woolrich despised this movie. And now I'm going to try to explain to you why he despised it. Um, it was based on a novel of his, uh, the same name, The Black Angel, and uh, you have to read The Black Angel to realize how different it is from the movie. And uh, not relying on my memory anymore, I'm a little bit on in years, I wrote up something to remind myself of what the novel was about. Uh, it was published in 1943. It's uh, one of the, I think, one of the strongest, the strangest, one of the most wrenching of all the Woolrich novels. And it's the only one that is narrated throughout in first person by a woman. Very, very few male authors of Woolrich's time would have had the guts and the chutzpah to do that. He did. Now, superficially, it looks like a standard suspense novel about a woman being menaced. Uh, but once you crack its thin surface, you're in that jolting night world that is Woolrich's private domain and you're locked inside the mind and heart of one of his most twisted people. Uh, well, like a lot of Woolrich novels, uh, it reminds us of other Woolrich novels. Uh, if you read any of Woolrich, you may have sensed that if you've read about The Black Angel. For example, I mean both books, The Black Angel and his famous Phantom Lady, uh, involved a race against a clock to save an innocent man that got uh, convicted of murder. This time, unlike Phantom Lady, it's uh, the man's girlfriend, uh, not his wife who's been killed, and it's the wife who risks everything to save her philandering husband from the chair. Uh, it's also sort of like The Bride Wore Black from 1940, in that in the, the novel, well, you don't get this in the movie. It's a series of disconnected episodes uh, about a tormented, psychotic woman who enters the lives of various men and devastates each of them in a different way. Uh, in the novel, the black angel is, her name is Alberta Murray, and her husband's name, as in the movie, is Kirk. And Kirk has taken up with this nightclub entertainer who has the same initials as the uh, dead woman in the movie, but different name, Mia Mercer. Well, uh, Alberta, the black angel, finds Kirk's packed suitcase hidden in a closet. Now she knows what, up until this point, she had only feared, namely that uh, Kirk is about to dump her for this woman. And so she forces herself to go to the woman's lavish apartment in New York, here, in Sutton Place, not California, not L.A., and begged, beg for her man back. And uh, 
She uh, finds the entrance door unlocked. She finds Mia on the bedroom floor, smothered to death with a pillow, not strangled with a scarf. Uh, at that moment, Mia's phone rings. I mean, nothing like this, of course, has happened in the movie, as you know now. Uh, the phone rings, Alberta panic-stricken lifts the receiver to shut off the sound, and she hears her husband, Kirk's voice, at the other end. And obviously, he didn't do it. He's, he thinks she's alive and he's calling her. She hangs up without a word. Now, she is convinced that Kirk is, in, is innocent, and she's frantic, as in the movie, to protect him. And so she steals Mia's address book from the apartment. Now, on the way out, she notices, and she also takes with her a match folder uh, monogrammed with the single letter M. Now, here we have something that happened in the movie, uh, which she finds wedged in the seam of the entrance door, apparently by the real murderer, who, it seems, visited Mia openly once and then sneaked back to kill her. Well, Alberta does not report the murder to the police. She doesn't even think to call Kirk at his office and tell him he is dead until it's too late and uh, he's in the hands of the police. He's on his way, well, he's on his way up to her place. And the next time she sees him, he's handcuffed to a cynical cop whose name, as in the movie, is Flood, and he's under arrest for Mia's murder. A few pages later, uh, and this is followed in the movie, actually, because Woolrich was, I guess we could call him legally challenged. <laughs> he knew no law, didn't want to learn any law, and when he tried to play around with law, lawyers roll their eyes and crack up. Uh, and so Woolrich spares us the trial scene, just as Roy William Neal did in the movie, uh, and... Uh, the, um, very quickly, we find out he's awaiting execution. He's sitting in the death house, and she uh, receives his belongings and goes through them. The police have returned them to her, and uh, she discovers that the monogram batch folder that she took from Mia's apartment does not belong to Mia herself. And so she concludes right away, and this is Ridiculous, but the intensity of Woolrich's prose makes it easy for us to forget that it's ridiculous. She concludes, the real murderer has to be one of the four names on the M page of Mia's address book. So what, she, what does she do? She goes to Flood. And what does Flood do? What would a normal cop do under these circumstances? He'd send out some, some munchkins to find out whether any of the four M's uh, in, the, in the address book, uses monogram patch folders. Does he do that? No. Instead, he agrees to backstop a crazy and really time-intensive plan that Mia comes up with. Remember, her husband is sitting in the death house, and she decides to enter the life of each M in turn and try to put the murder on them. Okay, for the rest of the novel, we are with her, we are inside her as she carries out this mission. The first M is Martin Blair, who is a hopeless alcoholic, and she insinuates herself into his wretched life, and unlike Dan Duryea, he commits suicide early on in the book. And does our black angel blame herself? No, she says, I was kind to him. I gave him something to die for. It's better to die for something than to live for nothing. You wouldn't catch June Vincent saying anything that uh, would render her that unsympathetic. And that's one of the many things the filmmakers changed to make the protagonist much more sympathetic. Okay, so she, uh, Marty Blair has killed himself and she goes on to the second M, a guy named Mordaunt, who was a doctor and has a sideline of pushing narcotics. And he takes her into his operation as a delivery person. Uh, well, that episode is very suspenseful and uh, full of anguish, but uh, Mordaunt remains sort of a monster, a pulp monster. Not very interesting. Alberta comes out of that nightmare intact, 
and with proof that the doctor is not the M she's after. Uh, so she goes after M3, who was a wealthy bon vivant named Lad Mason. And as Anne pointed out over dinner, Lad Mason is sort of a 1920s F. Scott Fitzgerald character. Woolrich, here as an undergraduate at Columbia, sold his first novel as a junior, quit Columbia, thought he was going to be the next F. Scott Fitzgerald, and, uh, well, it didn't happen. Anyway, um, Alberta, the black angel, entices Lad Mason into a relationship. And then she gets Flood to set up hidden dictaphone equipment in her apartment so that she can preserve anything damning that Mason might let, let slip. And eventually, something does. He admits in an intimate moment that he had visited Maya, Mia on the day of her death and found her body on the floor. Uh, well, she leaves him asleep in her apartment and goes on to M4, the last guy, whose name is McKee. And he is a gambler and a gangster and a nightclub owner, sort of character you find in many pulp stories by Woolrich and many pulp stories by other people. And she auditions for and lands a spot in his club's chorus line. And pretty soon, she's living in his apartment on Central Park West. And she induces him to give her the combination to a safe. At the earliest opportunity, she opens it to hunt for evidence of his connection with Mia. That uh, brooch doesn't appear in the novel at all. And, uh, but she's caught by his goons, and she's taken out to be executed. Well, I won't go on any further. This, at this point, uh, all connection between the novel and the movie vanishes. Uh, but it ends with our black angel. He, she, she's torn by love for somebody who was dead. She shattered inside as she had shattered others. She is executioner and victim in one flesh. That's the black angel that Woolrich wrote. Well, Fred Danae, whose papers are also here, better known as Ellery Queen, once said of Woolrich this, his driving narrative power carries readers on the crest of a tidal wave, and they are equally oblivious of the long arm of co coincidence and the long arm of uh, incredibility when they're immersed in what he's writing. Even though he says there might be a hole in the plot structure that would destroy an ordinary story. And that's really an inspired description of the raw material that Roy William Neal and Roy Chancellor, the screenwriter, had to deal with when they made The Black Angel the movie, three years after the book came out. Um, and, uh, okay, they radically altered the movie. Uh, Roy William Neal was born in 1886. He was in the business way back when. He's best known, I think, for people alive today for, as Anne mentioned before, the Sherlock Holmes movies with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. Uh, well, he and Roy Chancellor took on these jobs. They had to tighten the novel structure, first of all. Episodic in Golden Age Hollywood is a four-letter word. So they had to unify and tighten the structure. They had to reduce the number of male characters. They had to make the female lead a lot more sympathetic than Woolrich did. And at the same time, try to preserve the Woolrich qualities of suspense and anguish. Tall order. Uh, well, Woolrich's Alberta, of course, becomes June Vincent playing the part of Catherine Bennett. Durier uh, is sort of a, an amalgam of two of the main male characters in the novel, <coughs> Marty Claire, who's killed off early on, and Lad Mason, the socialite. Uh, Dr. Mordaunt, forget it. He doesn't ever show up. Uh, that whole part of the book was scrapped. Uh, and in the movie, that monogram matchbook leads our female lead not to several men, the way it did in the book, but to one who was Peter Laurie, of course. And Peter Laurie, as Marco, more or less corresponds to McKee <coughs> in the novel. Uh, and, of course, in the novel, 
the black angel, the woman, carries on her quest alone in the novel. As you've seen, she and Durier are partners in that quest. And uh, as we saw, Durier lives through the movie. And uh, although what's going to happen to him after the end titles, uh, we sort of suspect. Uh, and uh, Durier, of course, as we saw in the movie, falls in love with June Vincent, pretty much the way Lad Mason in the novel did with Woolrich's Black Angel. But in the movie, uh, June Vincent doesn't return Durier's love. She remains loyal to her convicted and unfaithful husband. <laughs> many, many changes, and there are many more I'm not even going to take time to cover. Uh, but nevertheless, I say, and I think Anne agrees with me, every frame of this film is permeated by the spirit of Cornell Woolrich. Uh, every shot has a style that translates Woolrich's novel into film with total fidelity to the soul of the novel and precious little to the text. <laughs> it was Roy William Neal's, I think, finest film, also his last. And uh, I should say a few words about his death. I mentioned Basil Rathbone. We are now going to hear from Basil Rathbone, believe it or not. He's dead in 1967, but uh, a couple of years before he died, he gave a talk here in New York. I was not present. A friend of mine was who had a tape recorder and taped his talk and gave me a copy of it. The sound is pretty poor. I think you'll be able to understand it, but in case you can't, I have a transcript here. Would you please uh, play what Basil Rathbone said about his last meeting with Roy William Neal? There was a little man called Roy Neal. He was a comparatively unknown director, but he had uh, great devotion to the stories. And uh, after, after, after the first two at Fox, Fox decided not to make it more. I don't know, I couldn't tell you why. And Universal took it up. And the little Roy Neal took over the whole thing. He was the producer director and writer, with uh, another of a man who helped out in the writing called Mulhauser. Um, these, these scripts were prepared for the one month before we were to appear on the set. Uh, we were called down, we were sent the scripts. There was Dennis Hurley, who played the star, there was Nigel Bruce, uh, Watson, myself, and whomever the leading woman, or perhaps one other important character, the Moriarty, it would be uh, Nan Lasso, or uh, Henry Daniel, or uh, George, George Zuckow, wasn't that his name? George Zuckow, yeah. Uh, we would read, and we would read through the script. And uh, Roy would say, now, if you fellas want to make any comments, this is the time, uh, because um, here in this story goes into production, <laughs> and on Monday, April 9th, it will start shooting at 9 o'clock. Well, uh, if there were comments to be made, if there was anything that bothered any of us, we were allowed, we spoke at that time, and uh, if there were yellow pages come along later, they would turn up within a matter of two or three days. Um, the preparation, uh, the um, economy in time, none of those pictures made at Universal took more than 17 days. We uh, never started shooting before nine, which is a normal, normal time. Today, they said, you we need to uh, Nine o'clock until six. No night work unless it was so specified that it was for, for nine work. Four o'clock was half an hour to peak. And this was, this, this move 
the, the, uh, of the of the whole of the making of these pictures, they had a um, sense of family. We all got along very well together. We had our little differences from time to time. But the one lovely character of them all was our dear friend uh, Roy Neal, the director. Uh, there were 12 very special experiences. Uh, I know you will understand when I say that I treasure the memory of every single one of them in spite of the fact that I treasure it now. At the time, obviously, you cannot go on continuously playing the same role and at the same time playing 39 weeks of radio for seven years so that you are saturated to an extent where you lose your sense of proportion and your sense of, of pleasure and uh, enjoyment. But eventually, without realizing it, somehow it came to an end Universal decided not to make any more pictures. And at that moment, I decided I wasn't going to do any more radio. That drove smooth fine of MCA into a catalyst because he was ready with another seven year contract. And I just said to myself, I think another seven years, I was going to stop writing mad. So I hoisted off to New York. And, um, when I arrived in New York, I think it is to be sure that, that uh, one has been so, so firmly associated with this character that no producer in New York would touch me as a bark for. No matter whether it was a play that I was suited for or not. And uh, in a couple of cases, uh, it was very, very pretty. Uh, yes, I think there's no question that uh, uh, right down your street. But you can't walk around that stage uh, without being home. I don't care whether you have on a program or playing captures or what. And I really, for a year, I was very, very disturbed because I find out I thought this was the end. So you know, what did it for me? And then, dear Jerry Harris. Yeah, crazy, Jerry Harris. Uh, gave me the air. And um, one night to the theater, came a musical, Roy Neal. You know, we loved him. We called him Mousy. Little guy. Little guy, and sweet as they come. So a very good disciplinarian. Uh, we called him Mousy, and he was very sweet of us. But um, uh, we didn't um, disobey orders. And uh, we were always on time, and we always knew our lines, and it was a thoroughly professional setup. And I am told by the universal uh, people, whether, whether uh, my figures are correct, I, I really couldn't say. I'm told that the first picture cost $178,000, and that the book cost $230,000. And uh, in the universe, Print money today compared to almost anything that you can do. In fact, it's almost impossible in the making days and years to do a picture for 178,000. So I came to my dressing room in a gray flannel suit and a white carnation, little boy in the And he was going home which was made in it on Thames in England for the first time in, oh, some very, very long time, I got 15 odd years. And um, he was very emotional about this affair. He took the keys out of his pocket. He showed me, said, you see that key? That opens the door to my home. And made in head on the Thames. Uh, he had had a housekeeper stay there for all this time, waiting for this wonderful moment when after 
making substantial money. He was able now to go home and enjoy his life on the river Thames. And he boarded the ship. I learned, learned this later. He arrived. He uh, went to Maidenhead. And he put the key into the front door. He turned it. He walked into the hall of his home and dropped dead. That was what Basil Rathbone said here in New York around 1965. Uh, sound was not very good, but, uh, and we don't, uh, when I uh, transcribed this years ago, did I take it as 100% uh, factual? No. I went and checked out the obituary on Roy William Neal in the New York Times which simply said that uh, he had died of a heart attack in London at the home of a nephew. So Rathbone might have been embellishing the facts for the sake of a good story, but if he wasn't, to the extent he wasn't, what a Woolrich-like death for the man who had just made what up to that time was probably the finest film based on Woolrich. Well, Woolrich, as I said when I started, despised this film. He thought it was a disaster. How do we know this? Because early in 1947, he got a letter from one of his professors here at Columbia, Mark Van Doren, pretty well known himself. Uh, Van Doren had just seen the movie you just saw. And Woolrich had not seen it yet. He then went out to see it and wrote a letter to Van Doren, dated February 2nd, 1947. He said, I'll just quote a little bit of this. I was so ashamed when I came out of there. All I could keep thinking of in the dark was, is that what I wasted my whole life at? <laughs> well, since you now know how radically Roy William Neal and his collaborators altered the novel, you can sort of understand Woolrich's point of view. If you had written the novel that was based on and found that much difference, uh, you'd be upset too, I suspect. And uh, Woolrich despised the movie. But that doesn't mean Woolrich was right. Uh, for my money, and I believe Anne agrees with me, this is one of the best finest of all the many movies based on Woolrich. It, uh, it holds up extremely well. I was three years old when it came out. I didn't see it then, but I saw it uh, many times in later years, and uh, I did not fall asleep this evening either. I uh, hope you didn't. Uh, Anne, shall we talk? Uh, yes, I thought uh, just one thing I wanted to say. This was my fourth viewing of the film since Sunday. So however many days that is. And that wasn't because I was trying to learn it. I'd already seen it um, before. It was rather that I simply couldn't stop staying in the world of that film. It was so complete. I just kept restarting as it hit the end. And I, I want to say, um, because of course you are so right about how incredible the plot, particularly in the novel, but in both. The idea that these two people, you know, who've been He's been a professional entertainer. She's been in the murder trial of the last decade. And they go with just thin aliases to a club on Sunset Strip, and no one recognizes them. Um, you know, it is quite fantastic. But if we think of Vertigo, which is officially now considered the greatest film ever made, it is so much more incredible than the stuff. I don't even start. And we could go to Mulholland Drive, uh, which, sorry about this, which um, is somewhere quite high on the official list of the greatest films of all times. And I can't even figure it out <laughs> plot-wise, much less tell you if it makes any sense. Now, I thought, because am I right that we are supposed to wind up around 10? Is that correct? 
Yeah, okay. So since we don't have that much time, I thought I would, I have lots of questions I want to ask. We've already talked our hearts out uh, over dinner. Um, but I thought I'd give you a chance to ask some questions now so you wouldn't be cut off. Remember, this man is also a mystery writer, a distinguished award-winning mystery writer in his own right. Um, and be careful I will, or I will blush. Oh, okay. Um, I, I would be interested, wouldn't you, to see him blush. Um, he, he fell in love with Woolrich in high school, wanted to write an essay on him, a senior essay, and was told, you can't write about him. He's not serious. He's not important. But he was not deterred. So we see him 60 years later, which is a tribute not only to him, but to Woolrich. Uh, he has gotten some real sustenance from Woolrich and the world of Woolrich all this time. So if any of you want to ask any questions of him, um, anything from law and noir to the movie versus the book to more about Woolrich, now is really your chance. Well, I wasn't sure who the murderer was in the book. Uh, I I believe the murderer was Lad Mason. But, yeah, but it's been a while. it was. Yeah, okay. My memory has not failed. <laughs> Hooray for me! You know, I'm yeah. 76. Not many people that age uh, can remember as far back as I can. <laughs> I'm proud of myself. I'll blush again pretty soon. <laughs> Yes, it was. It was indeed Lad who was the killer, and it turns out he's also an epileptic um, and was having a fit. I, I won't go into it. It's complicated, but there's no doubt in the novel that he, the guy with the most beautiful 20s charm and voice, and it's kind of like the Great Gatsby smile by Fitzgerald, that smile that singles you out of everyone in the world. Well, he has a voice like that. And she falls in love with him. That's the part they should have kept, as far as I'm concerned, in the movie. But it's hinted at at the end when you only briefly see her husband's photograph in which she looks very much like a psychopath to me. Um, and then you circle down to the sheet music, that the music that, that um, that Dan Durier wrote for her that they sang together. And when, when, um, when Flood says to him, you know what this means when he confesses, I assume he means you'll be headed for the gas yes. chamber. And I think that's what he thinks when he says, don't be sad, I'm not. We were a good team while it lasted. Uh, so any questions here? Someone's, we have, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was struck by the uh, comparison in a way to um, uh, Lost Weekend. Especially uh, the scene, you know, uh, which has incidentally a lot of raked angle shots, which uh, is, is one of the characteristics of film noir. Right. And uh, I thought it was just like you had mentioned previously, brilliant camera work, just amazing. It yes, and uh, this impressed me years ago. It still impresses me as it has impressed Anne, and I hope most of you. It's a. Uh, yeah, and Ray Milland had made that. Ray Milland had made that movie with Billy Wilder just the year before. To, yeah, just the uh, year, year before. A year or two before, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> in your forty-five. Mm. Yes. I wanted to ask about music uh, in uh, Woolrich. Um, I'm thinking of the films I've seen. I have not read Woolrich. I'm embarrassed to say. But I'm thinking of the fact that the Kevin McCarthy character in one of the films we saw last night was a clarinetist. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, all this music in the film tonight. We have the song that's coming into being slowly in rear window. And I'm just wondering if any of this, I mean, because in many, in many cases, these oh, and, uh, Phantom Lady, the amazing yeah. jam oh. session in yeah. there. Is Which there we any... showed in the festival last year. Yeah. yeah, and so so is Woolrich at all cued into that, or is this something yes. the filmmakers? Very much so. Uh, Woolrich often uses lyrics from the current songs to express the mood of the scene. That's very common in Woolrich. Uh, well, uh, I notice, and there's no counterpart 
to this in the novel, the reference to Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony. <laughs> you don't find classical music references in Coleridge. You find jazz, popular music, things of that sort. And you also find, now and then, opera, of all things. And not in this uh, movie, but Woolrich tells us that when he was about 10 years old and living in Mexico with his father, his mother's father, his maternal grandfather, came down to Mexico City and took him to see a performance of Madame Butterfly, which was then a pretty new opera. And that shaped Woolrich's life. It uh, introduced him to color and drama and tragedy and unhappy endings and so much of what permeates the novels and stories he wrote when he grew up. And you find all sorts of references to Madame Butterfly in Woolrich's novels and stories. In the very first novel, the one that when it sold, he quit Columbia, uh, there's a scene where somebody takes a, a kid to see Madame Butterfly, and someone else says, that opera should not be seen by any kid. Uh, but it was a determining moment that, that evening in Woolrich's life. I, I just want to add um, that Woolrich, as I know from, from Mike, Woolrich was himself a quarter Jewish. His grandfather, great-grandfather, was a rabbi in Odessa. Uh, we don't know if he even knew this, um, much less acknowledged it, but he was part Mexican. So as, as Mike said earlier to me, he was in American much. In yeah, American I, world. one of my one-liners about uh, Woolrich, he was an, a typical American mutt. He was a Canadian, Mexican, Russian Jew, born in New York. <laughs> we have time for one more question, is that right? Yes. Uh, we were talking about the music, and I was watching as carefully as I could. It looked like Dan Duryea was really playing the piano. Is that true? Uh, yes, actually, he was, unbelievably. Very good. Because, well, there was some dubbing going on, but it was his hands. And he was not a piano player. As I said, he gave everything he had to this role. And so he spent three weeks doing nothing but learning to play the piano. That, that shows you what actors do. Yes. I remember, well, I, of course, I was not present at that talk that Basil Rathbone gave. But I did hear him give a talk in 1964, I guess it was, at a girls' school in New Jersey. And he looked just as preternaturally slim as we all remember him. He had lost a lot of his hair. His voice was still clearly that unique voice. He was not English, you know. He was South African. And I think that explains the unusual uh, accent in which he spoke. But I remember he, he said, of course, he was uh, the bad guy in The Adventures of Robin Hood with Earl Flynn. And I remember he said, you know, he knew swordplay. He was a swordsman. Earl Flynn was not. And that one said, you know, I could have killed him if I wanted to. <laughs> Rathbone was uh, an important figure in my formative years. And I'm delighted that I got to, I never got to meet him, but I did get to hear him live. Mm. Okay, well, I guess that's it, and thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming, all of you. Thank you, Mike.